Well, good evening. This evening, we're going to be looking at the, the next great epic, the next great stage in God's redemptive history. And, and we come to one that is quite possibly the, the, the greatest in terms of direct magnitude to our understanding of Christ. And, and that's because we're going to be speaking about all the things that we've already sung this evening. We're going to be speaking about the king, Christ as king, and, and the covenant that establishes that, the Davidic covenant. And, and it plays directly into the unfolding of the rest of not only the Old Testament, but really as we're going to see our future as well. And as we've gone through this series, we've seen God's eternal promise to Adam that he would send a Messiah. He would send one who would defeat the serpent. Then to Noah, that he would preserve humanity until that Messiah came, but that there would be final judgment. Then to Abraham, we found that the Lord, through one particular family, would bring a blessed descendant to all the nations, that that one particular family would be the recipient of specific blessings and boundaries and, and, and bountiful children. Last week, we considered the Mosaic Covenant that takes place within the scope of the Abrahamic. That God would especially care for <clears throat> the people of Israel so long as they obeyed him. And in making this covenant, the Lord established a program for relating to him. And that program would foreshadow the Messiah's work to bring about reconciliation for the people. And with each of these, one of the things that we've stressed or that we've, we've really tried to communicate is that everything that follows after the giving of these covenants then is related to what comes next. It, it, it's related to the unfolding and the fulfilling of these promises. When an event takes place, we just need to consider, okay, where is it in relationship to these covenants? And we can understand this plays some part in fulfilling or is a fulfillment of one of these covenants. And one of the reasons I stress that, particularly this evening, is because I'm afraid sometimes we can make the mistake of thinking that God is reactive. We fall into the trap of thinking that God is like us. That he's just making plans as best he's able, but ultimately he's just keeping up with the day-to-day -day events and responding to whatever comes down the pike just like us. One of the responsibilities that, that I have here at, at, at the church is working with the calendar and helping plan out events and, and coordinate sort of when are we uh, going to have conferences, when are these things going to happen, Be, begin lining up our conference speakers. This season has been particularly difficult because as we roll into the summer, we, we typically have X, Y, and Z event, and we know that this is going to happen, and here's the timeline that we have to operate within. If this was any normal year, which, man, we know that it's not, if this was any normal year, we would typically already have our speakers booked for next year's conferences, maybe even their tickets bought for them to come down here. And so as we sat in staff meeting several weeks ago, there was sort of this question of, well, what do we do? How do we plan? We plan for this Sunday. Because we have to respond. We have to react. We don't know what the future holds. Our God is not like this, beloved. And we slip so comfortably into this pattern that even clear teaching is of Scripture. We, we think, we negate, we negate clear teachings of Scripture when we think this way. We think that, oh, God is just responding to what I do and therefore he has done this. God is responsive to the chaos of the universe and so he just must be sort of living life like I do. But scripture is clear. God is sovereign and not merely reactionary. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. He sees the end from the beginning. He is the alpha and the omega. He is the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And we need to recognize that our God reigns. He does not merely react. Which takes us directly to our big idea for this evening, particularly for our little listeners. Our big idea for this evening is who is your king? Who is your king? You see, as we read the scripture, sometimes we detach ourselves from the big picture of what God is doing. We can mistakenly think that God isn't really king. He's just sort of a negotiator. He's kind of a slick operator that when things arise, he can react so well and put something into place that it's just like 
you know, that's what he was doing all along, right? When instead the Lord is the architect of all ages. He's the one ordaining all things according to the counsel of his will and they're never in danger of coming undone and no one can turn back his purposes. I remember hearing an old pastor once quip, has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? And when we read the scripture, we don't have to think that God was just responding to the circumstances as they arose. Instead, he had his plan from the beginning. He is ruling, he is reigning from his heavenly throne throughout all time, accomplishing his will. And so this evening, as we go to look at the Davidic covenant, I want us to go to the book of Genesis. Genesis 17, and you can begin turning there. And there's a number of places that we could look, even here in the book of Genesis, but I want us to start with Abraham in Genesis 17, where the Lord is reiterating and expanding on the covenant that he's already cut with Abraham, and he promises there in Genesis 17, beginning in verse 6, I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. I will establish my covenant between you, me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. Later in Genesis 35, the same promise is going to be made to Jacob, Abraham's grandson. In Genesis 35, 11, the Lord God also said to him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply a nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come forth from you. By the time Jacob is called Israel, as he's close to death there at the end of the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 49, you can be turning there, he's passing on blessings to his son. He's giving authority to these who will become the heads of the tribes of Israel. And he can't give the headship to the first three, to Reuben, Simeon, or Levi, because of their prior actions. But instead, in Genesis 49, Jacob, or Israel, is going to say to Judah, beginning in verse 8, Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down to you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He couches, he lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who dares rouse him up? Verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. He ties his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washes his garments in wine and his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are dull from wine, his teeth white from milk. Verse 10 here in particular is this massive promise, until Shiloh or to whom it belongs comes, until the one that we're expecting arrives. All the way back in Genesis 49, we've got the promised king. There's a ruler coming, the scepter, the staff, the praise of verses 8 through 10, the obedience of the peoples, all that indicating rule is going to take place through the family of Judah. There is a king coming. But remember, this is 400 years before Moses. This is 800 years before David. So please understand, God is not reactive. He's not piecing some plan together as he goes along. In fact, during the days of Moses, God lays the foundation for the king of Israel. Go ahead and turn to Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17. As we looked at last week, this is the second giving of the law. This is just before the nation of Israel, who had been children as they exited Egypt, and as they're on the brink of going into the promised land, Moses is restating the covenant with them. Beginning in Deuteronomy 17, verse 14, Moses says to the people, when you enter the land, Deuteronomy 17, 14, when you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you and you possess it and live in it and you say, I will set a king over me like all the nations who are around me, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. One from among your countrymen you shall set as king over yourselves. You may not put a foreigner over yourselves who is not your countryman. Moreover, he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor shall he cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never again return that way. 
It's going to go on and give the, the foundation for that throne, ways in which the king should exercise himself. Verse 18, now it shall come about when he sits on the throne of his kingdom. He shall write for himself a copy of this law on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priest. It shall be with him and he shall read it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by carefully observing all the words of this law and these statutes that his heart may not be lifted up above his countrymen and that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right or the left so that he and his sons may continue long in his kingdom in the midst of Israel. You see, the Lord is giving them a glimpse of what a godly king ought to look like so that that king can learn to be godly. So that that king that they will eventually ask for and that God himself will choose will be a reflection of that very God who ultimately sits on the throne. Moving to the next centuries of Israel's history, they lived through the period of the conquering of Canaan and Joshua. Then the period of the judges. And in the book of Judges, we're reminded several times, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his, in his own eyes. And this lack of direct representative authority in the nation brings about ruin. The Lord's their leader. They're essentially a theocracy. But because there's no figure for them to follow except judges who would come and, per, come and go periodically, the nation of Israel is spiraling towards disaster. And again, don't think that God is saying, whoop, that got out of hand quick, didn't it? Instead, the Lord is teaching them in all of this. He's permitting them, go ahead your way. Look what happens when you don't take heed to my law, which is what happens the opening of the book of Judges. The people begin to forsake the commandments of God. They forget and they go on. And we see as a result, this is what happens. There's no one to restrain. Then we come to the book of 1 Samuel. You can go ahead and turn there, 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8, we'll begin in verse 4. First Samuel chapter 8, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, Behold, you've grown old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king for us to judge us like all the nations. Sound familiar? It's incredible when you hold passages of Scripture side by side. This is exactly what God said would happen in the book of Deuteronomy. Verse 6, but the thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Like all the deeds which they have done since the day that I brought them up from Egypt even to this day, and that they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. Now then, listen to their voice. However, you shall solemnly warn them and tell them of the procedure of the king who will reign over them. They want to establish their own ruler. They're dissatisfied with following the Lord, but they're warned in verses 10 through 18. They're warned what it will be like to have a king. And verse 19 summarizes, nevertheless, the people refuse to listen to the voice of Samuel. Now understand, I, I think, again, this is one of those places where, where we tend to think or we're tempted to think, oh man, what's, what's God going to do now? I'm sure he was blindsided by this. I, I, I know even in my own reading of this, sometimes we can read tones into the Bible that aren't really there, that God is sort of just, I'm just exhausted. Go ahead, go ahead. Like a parent that's sick of disciplining, they're just sort of like, all right, go ahead. If you want to do that, go ahead. But that's not what the Lord is doing here. Or sometimes we can slip into thinking, oh, God is going to rescue this situation. He, he's going to, he didn't know this was going to happen, but don't worry, he's going to fix it. But understand, God's intention had been to bring them a king in his time according to his purpose. He would redeem this dissatisfaction to establish his purpose. The Lord wasn't responding in some reactive way to the whims of the people. Rather, 
He was permitting their hardness of heart to pave the way for his perfect purpose. The Lord is even overcoming their sin. Please don't forget this. Please don't forget that we serve a God who occupies an eternal throne and he isn't tossed around like we are by the five-minute news cycle. He's not trying to adjust plans and coordinate with the latest in people's desires. He dances to no one's tune. So the Lord reigns, which is why there's no note of resignation in verse 22 of chapter 8. When the Lord says to Samuel, Listen to their voice and appoint them a king. Because underneath that, the Lord isn't surrendering to the negotiations. He isn't saying, fine, you'll be sorry. He's saying, this accomplishes my purpose. They would be more pleased with doing it my way according to my command, but because they've insisted, they'll have the reign of Saul so that they'll appreciate, respect, and recognize the reign of David. commenting on this passage, Dale Ralph Davis observed, there was nothing inherently sinful in wanting a king. Instead, it's why they wanted one. They wanted a substitute for Yahweh's direct leadership. That's the indictment of verse 7. They've not rejected you. They have rejected me. They're rejecting the Lord's leadership. They wanted a king to rule rather than Yahweh. And beloved, how often and how easily are we satisfied with lesser things? They would rather a frail and fallible man than the man of God's own choosing. What's terrific here is the grace of God on display. God gives them this. And eventually it's going to usher in himself on the throne. Which takes us all the way to 2 Samuel chapter 7. Now we're skipping a lot. It's a long and winding road to where we are in 2 Samuel chapter 7. But eventually some decades after... this record in 1 Samuel 8, David is established as the king in Zion. He sits now on the throne of Israel from the city of peace. He's just brought the ark of God to be situated at the capital of the nation. And in doing so, he is giving us just the smallest glimpse of what will be promised in a king who mediates the presence of God to the people. And in 2 Samuel 7, David tells the prophet of his day, Nathan, in verse 2, see now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within tent curtains. David looks around at his situation and says, this isn't right. I live in a house and God's presence is in a tent. The place of atonement, the place where God has promised he's going to set his throne. Let's get a house worthy of his honor. And we don't have time. There's so much. One one day, one day I'm going to teach this, okay? Okay, Pastor Philip, I'm calling dibs now. There's, there's so much here that we don't get to unpack. But the Lord is going to turn this all around in such a spectacular fashion. I wasn't planning to read most of this, but, but, but look at what happens. Nathan responds to David and says, do all that's in your heart. The Lord is with you. But, we're told, In verse 4, in the same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, Go and say to my servant David, thus says the Lord, Are you the one who should build me a house to dwell in? And he begins this sort of series of questions to say, David, you know, I didn't ask for this. No one has ever even thought to do this to me. And I've never said to them, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Verse 8, Now therefore, Thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Yahweh of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people of Israel. I've been with you wherever you have gone and cut off all of your enemies from before you, and I will make you a great name, like the names of the great men who are on the earth. I will also appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may live in their own place and not be disturbed again, nor will the wicked afflict them any more as formerly. Even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Now listen to what he's about to say. The Lord declares to you that Yahweh will make a house for you. The Lord turns this around and says, You wanted to build a house for me? I'm going to make a house for you, David. You wanted to 
have a building that was befitting my honor. And Lord, and, and, and David, in my super abundant grace, I'm going to make a house, a dynasty for you. It's detailed in these verses and these recurring I will statements, all that the Lord is going to do. Among them is this everlasting aspect to David's line, his throne, his kingdom. It will have no end. There's going to be this unique relationship between David's descendants and Yahweh. In verse 14, we'll see, I will be a father to him, to the descendant that will come and sit on the throne, and he will be a son to me. Even in the next verses, Yahweh essentially says, this promise isn't going away. When they sin, I'm not going to leave your descendants. I will chasten them, but I will not abandon them. These promises are made to David that he's going to have an eternal king from his family. There's going to be an eternal kingdom from the throne of David and an everlasting bond to the children of David. And there's so much incredible stuff that, that we have to move on so we can see this in this greater light. Because the stage is set now for David's ultimate glory at this point. The Lord has, with just incredible, phenomenal grace, set his affection upon David. And David's response at the close of this chapter from verses 18 through 29 is to praise the Lord. And we have to pause here for just a second and recognize how unique and significant David now is. And to do that, I think the best place to see this is in the Psalms. So go ahead, turn with me to Psalm 110. Now, just as an aside, as you're turning there, when we see stuff like the imprecatory psalms, that's not what we're going to look at. When we see some of the way that David prays against his enemies, I know sometimes there's this, this idea of, <clears throat> can, I, can I do that? I've got this one coworker. But, but listen, David could pray like this because of these promises made to him, because of the unique place that he's going to occupy on the throne. Psalm 110, where you've hopefully just turned, it's the most often quoted psalm in the New Testament. It's first verse in particular. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. This is what Jesus referred to in our text in Matthew 22 just a few weeks ago when he asked the Pharisees, if David then calls him Lord, how is he also his son? This is the text Peter refers to in Acts 2 on Pentecost when he says, it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, referring to Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. The author of Hebrews quotes it in his opening chapter, declaring Christ better than all the angels when he says, for to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? It's also here in Psalm 110 that David begins to plant the seed of the unique priesthood status of the Davidic king. Keep reading with me, verse 2. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power and holy array from the womb of the dawn. Your youth are to you as the dew. Verse 4, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You're a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. So this, this occupier of the Davidic throne, he will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. In other words, this seated at the right hand of power, being given subjection of all the nations, he'll be a priest forever. We'll see the same theme across many other psalms, Psalm 89 or 73 or 132 or Psalm 24. Psalm 24 where the Lord who established all and has singularly accomplished worthiness to ascend to the hill of the Lord is announced at the gates of the city. Lift up your head, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. It's a king who is declaring his intention to enter into the city and commanding that they receive him. The question rings out from the ramparts as one demands entrance. Who is this king of glory? 
The answer is return. The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. In other words, all the way back here, it's established. Who is this glorious king? It's Yahweh. It's Yahweh strong and mighty. Yahweh mighty in battle. We can't be in Psalms and not look at Psalm 2 and see some of this. Turn with me to Psalm 2. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? By the way, if there's ever any question about the relevance of the word of God, look around and look here. The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast their cords away from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the king so that he not become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Beloved, this is a king to be reckoned with. This is Yahweh, the son. This is what Paul's gonna quote in Acts 13 when he's preaching in the, in the synagogue at Antioch, Pisidia. And he says, we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers, that God has fulfilled this promise to our children and that he raised up Jesus as it is also written in the second Psalm. You are my son, today I have begotten you. Then Paul connects that to another, another prophecy, that the Holy One of David would not undergo decay. But everyone there and all of us know that David and his descendants, they all died. They all underwent decay so that who was being spoken about? It was the Christ. It was Jesus, the one Davidic descendant who was not suffered to undergo decay. Which leads us to the rest of David's offspring. What follows shortly after the promise of 2 Samuel 7 It's going to be David's sin with Bathsheba. And again, even that, the Lord is going to bring about his purposes. From them will be born the heir to the throne, Solomon. And the book of Samuel continues. It doesn't really end with David's death. Instead, it ends with the the peaking of his kingdom. And the book of Kings opens really with the death of David. And what follows is chapter after frustrating chapter. Record after disappointing record of kings who never reached the heights of David. Solomon, even as he held greater wisdom, territory, wealth, and peace than his father, even he couldn't measure up. 1 Kings 3.3, 3, you don't have to turn, I'm going to be quoting a lot of places. 1 Kings 3.3, 3, at the beginning of his reign, Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David except he sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. At the conclusion of his reign in 1 Kings 11, verse 4, when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. And summarizing his reign, verse 6 of 1 Kings 11 says, Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They did not follow the Lord fully, as David, his father, had done. And on and on, the records will go. Each king introduced throughout the book measured according to the standard of David. If you're unfamiliar with the story, we gotta take just a step back so we can brace for what's coming. 
Solomon is the high point politically for the nation of Israel. It's always interesting when you read through the book of Ecclesiastes written by Solomon, he mentions you can labor all of your days, accumulate all of this wealth, and who knows what those who come after you will do it. Because Solomon's son, Rehoboam, will be rejected as king over all of Israel. He'll retain, because of the promise made to David, some of the tribes, namely uh, Judah, uh, 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 Levi, and, and a portion of Benjamin. And the rest will go to another king. It'll become the nation of Judah and the nation of Israel in the north, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And throughout their long history, Israel almost immediately is characterized by the sin of their first king. And the kings that follow him will be characterized as they followed in the sin. They walked in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat. And destruction comes upon them. They're carried away into captivity. For Judah, it's much the same. David's great-grandson, Abijah, says in 1 Kings 15, he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had committed before him, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God like the heart of his father David. Asa, Abijah's son, 1 Kings 15, Asa did what was right in the sight of the Lord like David his father. Every now and then there'll be this little glimpse. There'll be this, this tantalizing tease of maybe this guy's gonna do it. And for just a minute, just a minute, place yourself in the, in, in the citizenry of Judah. This sinful king has died. He's passed off the throne, but his son's coming. And we know the promises. They're recorded in our psalms that we sing. There's gonna be a great king. He's gonna be called the son of God. Let's see how he does. He takes the throne and he walks in the sins of his fathers. Until judgment is brought, chastening is brought, his reign ends, and another king comes. And he might do well. You've got Amaziah, generations later, 2 Kings chapter 14. He did right in the sight of the Lord, yet not like David, his father. He did according to all that Joash, his father, had done. And again, and again, and again. Building towards their ultimate destruction. Israel, the northern kingdom, has opportunity after opportunity for nearly three centuries. Regime change after regime change. And they got somebody else in office and it still doesn't go well. Until finally, the northern kingdom of Israel is destroyed. Judah, you'd think, would take heed that they would see what had happened to their brothers to the north and they would go, man, we, we ought to straighten up. He wasn't kidding. And it's like they quicken the pace. Things escalate and except for these brief moments, things like Josiah or Hezekiah or Uzziah for a little while, all of them fail. And for the people of Judah living now, they are connected to the family of David. We're of the tribe of David. He's just not the king. Maybe the next one. Understand, just like the uselessness of the law to accomplish salvation, all of this was on purpose. You see, with each king, especially towards the end, there's this growing anticipation you read the reign of the kings and wonder, is he going to get it? Is he going to be the guy? Because even all the while, the prophets are saying, there's going to be a king like David. He's going to rule. He's going to reign. There's going to be a glorious future. Isaiah, who prophesies in some of the deepest, darkest seasons of Judah's history, he's going to make promises like this. 
In Isaiah chapter 9, a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. A throne, this is later on, Isaiah 16. A throne will even be established in loving kindness and a judge will sit on it in faithfulness in the tent of David. Moreover, he will seek justice and be prompt in righteousness. I'm just gonna run through and I'm gonna read you. I have pages of this. Of promises that God is sending in the midst of these dark times. There's a king coming. Behold, a king will reign righteously and princes will rule justly. Your eyes will see the king in his beauty. They will behold a far distant land. For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. Thus says the Lord, the king of Israel and his redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last and there is no God besides me. Jeremiah prophesying even later than Isaiah will say, but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. Don't forget it. No matter what it looks like around you, Judah, even though it's dark, even though our enemies are literally at the gates, at his wrath, the earth quakes and the nations cannot endure his indignation. Because behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch and he will reign as King and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is, this is his name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteousness. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord. When I will fulfill the good word which I have spoken concerning the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, well, I will cause a righteous branch of David to spring forth. And he shall execute justice and righteousness on the earth. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell in safety. And this is the name by which she will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. And on and on we could go. And there's this mounting frustration as you read the Old Testament. Where's our king? Where is he? Who is he? Is it going to be this guy? They're eager to see, is this going to bring us the kingdom promised to David? There's this great expectation for the king of Judah. Things get so wicked and dark that the Lord swears that from one particular line his children will never sit on this throne until Judah is destroyed carried away into captivity but even in the midst of that prophets like Jeremiah and Ezekiel are promising there's still a king when they return they're no longer their own nation They're subjugated to whatever greater power sweeps through that region of the world. Even then, the Lord gives leaders. The Lord raises up people, but even in the midst of it all, where's our king? Who is our king? Which is why there's so much expectation and excitement built into that first statement of the New Testament, Matthew 1, 1. The genealogy of Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham. The king has arrived. Now you can understand the the confusion and the frustration Lord, are you the king or should we look for another? They tried to take him by force and make him king. This must be the king. Let's sing Hosanna. Wait a second, what's he doing being arrested? Lord, you can't tell them that you're going to die. That's not part of the plan. You understand why even the disciples would ask after 40 days with Christ, after his resurrection in Acts chapter 1, 
they gather around. And, and you can just use your sanctified imagination and you can see this. They're sort of clustering around him. As he goes up the Mount of Olives, man, this might be it. This might be it. And it, this is pure speculation, which is dangerous, I know. But it had to be Peter. Had to be Peter. Lord, is it now? Is it at this time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And what does he say? It's not for you to know. Instead, here's your mission. Instead, go and proclaim the gospel in all the earth. I don't know if you know what you sang this evening. Jesus shall reign or all the earth. Kingdoms from shore to shore. That was prophesied all the way back in the Old Testament. It's everywhere in Scripture. And we as the church are the emissaries of the kingdom. Planting the flag of Christ and the kingdom is within us. And yes, we are kingdom outposts as believers, as churches. We are representing, this is what it looks like to be citizens of the kingdom. But the kingdom isn't here yet. And we go and we proclaim that Jesus is king. And beloved, the mission is not finished. There are those yet to hear the gospel who will bow the knee to King Jesus. And we know that because he hasn't come back yet. Beloved, what people then ought we to be with lives of all holiness and godliness, proclaiming, pursuing the preaching of Jesus as king. The final enemies have not yet been placed underfoot. Death has not been cast into the pit. And yet our God rules and reigns from the right hand of the Father, exalted on high. But we're living in the time where we wait for the coming of our King. Where we wait for that glorious appearing. And beloved, this evening I have to exhort you. Don't look for another one. Don't look for this. This is not our home. The kingdom of the world is not yet the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. Understand, he exercises supreme authority over all of it. He is not exercising all of the full extent presently bodily yet. But he will. And in the meantime, don't exchange Jesus for a lesser king. Don't seek some other king thinking maybe this is the one. Maybe he can hold us over. Maybe it'll be good enough. Beloved, his coming is assured. The cry in Revelation from the angel is the judgments are coming to their close on the earth as the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. As saints around the throne sing the song of Moses, they call him king of the nations while declaring that he is worthy to receive all wisdom and dominion and power forever and ever. Defeat is promised for those who wage war against the Lamb. Revelation 17 says, there are some who will wage war against the Lamb and the Lamb will overcome them. Do you know why? Scripture's great. Because he is the Lord of Lord and King of Kings. And those who are with him are called the are the called and chosen and faithful. And in Revelation 19, when our great God and Savior comes riding out of heaven on a white horse, whose eyes are a flame of fire, and on whose head are many diadems, he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And arrayed with him is an army clothed in fine linen, white and clean on white horses. And he comes to strike the nations with a sharp sword coming from his mouth and rule them with a rod of iron, and on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Beloved, don't seek a lesser king. Don't put your hope in some lesser ruler. And when all is said and done, and the final enemy is defeated, heaven and earth have fled away, 
God has his dwelling with men. And there's the son of David seated on a throne from which a river of the water of life clears crystal flows. And there will no longer be any curse. And the throne of God and of the lamb will be in it. And his bondservants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. So believer, who's your king? Are you serving King Jesus? Is he your king? This evening, have you yielded to him? Have you submitted to him? Have you been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his beloved son? If you're a believer or to act like citizens of the kingdom, we don't have our own agenda. We are emissaries of the king and we act according to his orders. So beloved, who is your king? And are we living like it? Pray with me. Father God, what a glorious truth that you have in your sovereign good pleasure worked all things according to the accomplishing of your will to set your son on an eternal throne. And yet while we live here below, we are to act as agents of your kingdom. Lord, seeking not our own kingdom, not laboring futilely to bring about your kingdom by our own power, but rather to carry out your mission as you have ordained in your word, which never fails. Father God, may your name be exalted. May we this evening leave here reassured, rejoicing in the kingship of your son, to whom is all glory forever and ever. Amen.